So when I show up in life and I want to be of service and I love people and I love myself, you know, this has been a big thing for so many programs, people that come to my clinical fasting programs, at some point we get to this point where I ask individually, do you love yourself? And for me, being someone who does love myself, it's shocking to hear that somebody could say no to that. And in fact, most of the people that come to my programs, when I'm sitting with them one-on-one, -on -one, I'm like, ask them the question, do you love yourself? And then I really hold space. They can't say yes. They're just like, no, I don't. Hello, and welcome to The Real Success Show. I'm your host, Candice Mama. If you really want to get a grasp on your health, you've tried eating plan after eating plan or diet after diet, and you're just not getting it together, then today's guest is just for you. Tyler Tolman is an expert in how to get sustainable results when it comes to your health. But before we speak to Tyler, if you like this episode, you know what I need you to do. I need you to like, share, and subscribe so that more people will find us. Now, without further ado, here's Tyler. Tyler Tolman, thank you so much for being on The Real Success Show. Thanks for having me. Oh, we had a little bit of a plant conversation before this because both of us happen to love plants. Um, <laughs> but besides being a plant dad, um, when you describe yourself, Tyler, how do you describe yourself? Um, if I had to like describe myself, what I kind of do most for a living would be like a detoxification specialist. So somebody who assists people with major disease. I'm a big believer that major disease is from toxicity, from the environment, from the things that we put in, congestion, non-movement, you know, all these types of things. So what I do is specialize in helping those individuals facilitate major detoxification to get everything opening and working once again, uh, so they can get back to a situation of balance and health and away from disease. Mm. I love that. So, I mean, Tyler, I'm assuming that you've not always been this way. So what led you into this work? What led you into wanting to help people get into better, you know, uh, better relationships with their bodies, I'd say? Yeah, I love how you word that, better relationships with their bodies. So I was uh, born in Wenatchee, Washington, in the United States, moved to Spokane, Washington, I was the, the third child of a single mother, um, kind of welfare situation. So I went to public schools, had the, was raised by my mother, went to McDonald's, had the average American type of lifestyle um, and suppression of school. I was one of these outgoing kind of kids that was told to sit down and shut up. And luckily I was born when I was, otherwise I'd probably be on Ritalin and all these present day drugs and ADHD and labeled with all these things. Uh, but it was actually the age of 13, I had an opportunity to go stay with my father for the first time. Uh, and he had a 200 acre farm with peacocks and swans and ducks. And there were multiple like little ponds. And he had actually built these buildings where people could come and stay and facilitate uh, fasting, detoxification. So I got to spend three months with him. And the first month was like a huge shock. Uh, just the way they live their life, you know, they grew a lot of their own food and made juices and everybody was happy and loved each other. And, and I felt overwhelmingly loved because I had, you know, my dad and stepmom and all these other, you know, half and step brothers and sisters I never really knew. And it was like every day they would come and give you a hug and say, oh, I love you. And I'm so glad you're here. And it was just like full of love. And it was just like, wow, I'm totally not used to this. Um, and, you know, they got up early every morning, went for walks, watched the sunrise, like had these very specific rituals that were just completely foreign to me. And then about a month after kind of changing and integrating with this lifestyle, we had about 30 plus people show up with cancer, heart disease, skin conditions, morbidly obese, like all these people show up. And for me being 13, I was just like, oh my gosh, like what's happening here? Like, it's becoming a hospital, you know, people are going to die. I kind of freaked out a little bit, uh, but my father informed me what he did. He's like, every summer we have these big gatherings, we make juices and we teach people about, you know, 
earth and nature and natural principles, and we, we facilitate these detoxification programs. So I got to just sit back and, you know, being a 13 year old, just ready to absorb everything. I was actually making juices. I, you know, get the watermelons and cut them up and make juice and all these other things. And I ended up developing these relationships with people. Um, and you could see when they arrived, just like the layers of stuff, like darkness and just, you know, not the true essence of who these people were, just like masks and like fear and distrust and like just this energy, right? And I got to just observe how my dad would, you know, give discourses out in the sun and just talking about life and health and principles and everything he learned traveling around the world. And these people are just, you know, drinking juices and going off and doing these cleansing types of things that were weird. Um, and I got to see the layers strip off layers, layers, like fat, actual, like these energetic layers. And what I noticed is like at the end of this program, it is like every person was brought back to this like inner child. Everybody was playful. Everyone was super connected and loving. Like every day we wake up, we hug each other, we're out in the sun. And it's like this relationship that they redeveloped with themselves and with everybody else around them, the support and the love and the healing that took place. So after this summer and this amazing experience, I'd go back home and you know, go back to public school and have this suppressed kind of experience. And then the next year I'd go back and I would read like all the letters uh, that my father had received with, you know, back then it was like printed photographs and letters and of these people, three, four pages long that I had these relationships with that I kind of forgotten about and seeing the photos and like, yeah, I've, you know, I've been given the all clear for cancer. I've been, you know, all these different situations, just like, oh my God, like my dad, you know, and growing up, you know, I think my brothers and sister were a little resentful that my father wasn't there. And I just never knew the difference because he left before I was born. But it was like, wow, you know, at least now I know my father is like really out there changing the world and doing something good. I can kind of forgive him for not being there sort of thing. And now I want to learn the trait of my father. So, you know, little by little, I just like, oh, this is actually the way eventually when I was 16, I had a, a big breakdown. I was smoking cigarettes, drinking alcohol, doing, you know, involved with the wrong crowd of people in high school, got kicked out of high school. I uh, got to a point of being like suicidal um, and had to make a choice. Like I really was in the deepest, darkest place of my life at 16. And I was like, you know what? I, I know where I'm at and I, I don't like it. I don't like myself. And the only thing that I had in my mind was like my father and that way of living. And so I called him and said, dad, if I can't live with you, I'm not sure I want to live at all. I was crying. He said, have your mom take you to the airport, had a ticket waiting for me. And I flew out to live with him and I made a choice. And one day I was like, you know what? I'm, I choose to be of service. I don't know what I don't know. I'm just going to go live with my father and serve him because I trust in what he's doing is something good. And I want to change my life. You know, I don't want to steal. I don't want to cause harm. I just want to commit my life to being of service. And that's really where uh, everything truly started. Then I was truly listening to everything my father was teaching. We built a multi-million dollar uh, business over about three years with healthy products and educational types of stuff. And yeah, that's a lot, but that's how it began. No, I love that. And I love that backstory to understanding, right? Because sometimes we so focus on people's results, we don't actually pay attention to what got them to that place. And mm -hmm. you spoke about, you know, at that period at 16, when, you know, you were drinking, smoking, suicidal. I mean, even though you made the decision, what was going through your mind at that point? Like, how was your body feeling? How were you feeling as an individual? like a piece of garbage like an absolute piece of trash like you know I got kicked out of high school for having a bag of herbs in my car uh, I tried to get a job I'd get a job and I'd get fired within a couple of weeks for just you know random stuff I had no commitment and again you know I never really did have a father figure growing up my older brother was my father figure. So he smoked and drank 
he was three years older. So you can imagine when he started drinking and smoking, then I started at a super young age. Um, so yeah, I just felt like, I don't know, you could say maybe angry, but not just, just like I was, you know, what am I going to do <laughs> a piece of garbage, like not doing anything good for the world and just kind of hating myself and not having any direction. And so it was like that, that was just that, oh, but my father and those fasting programs. And then like, oh, if I could be about that, that would give me something to live for and to feel good about. And that's what I really grabbed onto. And then, you know, it changed, it flipped the feeling from feeling like a piece of garbage to like, oh, what do I have to do to not feel like a piece of garbage? Well, I have to like be of service and be about my father's work, I guess. Yeah. And I know that, you know, you were talking about the observation of these people coming and, you know, the first few weeks feeling or the first few days, them being a little uneasy. And as the process went, just getting better and better. And so what was that process like for you? Because I know that when we commit to our health, when we commit to any sort of change that is going to make our lives better, the first few weeks aren't the funnest weeks, you know, and that's when a lot of people quit. So like, how did it feel for you and why did you stay on? Well, you know, I wasn't fasting specifically myself. I was more so supporting, but through the observation, it's like, I have this saying nowadays, it's like today's chores are tomorrow's love affair. So what feels like a chore today to get up early and go exercise and this like, uh, monotonous and you don't like it tomorrow, meaning like in maybe a month or two months of consistency, it's this love affair, like you feel so good and so vibrant. And I would say that's, you know, probably what these people were going through is a situation of, you know, for the first time in their lives, actually taking in some true genuine life force juices, green juices, vegetable juices, fruit juices, you know, clean waters out of a deep, pristine well, you know, walking every day, we'd walk for about a mile, watch the sunrise, do some sun gazing. And yeah, it was just like the doubt and the toxicity coming out of these people was real. Like, I'd say, like you were saying, the first three to five days was just like, it was coming out of their skin, they were puking, it was coming out of every possible orifice. You know, now I call it the four channels of detoxification, which is defecation, urination, perspiration, respiration. So the body was detoxing all the acids and congestion and toxicity. But once they started to move through that, you would see like a light switch on. It was almost like a spark, like, oh, I have some energy. Oh, without all this toxicity and congestion, like I can move a little more and just the consistency of walking and drinking juices and actually embracing the sun. Yeah. It was just like these layers were coming off. And then it was almost like people started to have this level of trust for the people around them and my father and the people that were helping them. It was almost like, you know, at first they kind of believed, Oh, well, this is kind of a facade or they're just doing this to make money. And, but then it was like, oh, no, actually, this guy really cares and he's this light and he's trying to guide us and he's genuine, you know, through all the stories and the experience, and the way my father would show up for people in their deepest, darkest times. Like he wasn't just off somewhere while they're going through the shit. He was like right there with them holding their hair while they're puking and, you know, like really caring. And I think I think a big part of healing, like when you said the relationship they had with their body you know, when there's care and love and assistance through the process and people can see like, oh, you know what, someone actually does care about me and can support me, then they start to care for themselves and just little by little by little stripping away the layers and realizing like, oh, I can have life and I can have health and I believe and my, you know, it was like this consistent message every day of like, you can become whoever you choose. I don't care if you're terminal cancer. I don't care where you at. If you have that bit of hope and you're alive, you're alive for a reason. And this has happened to you for a reason. You can either use that reason to become something great, change the world and fulfill your purpose here on earth. Or you can stay where you're at and believe that you're going to die and what the doctors have told you and all these things. And it's a choice. And when you have that consistent message and juices and sunshine and peacocks and ducks and nature and people supporting you, you know, I don't know how you don't completely transform. And 
one of the most magical things is at the end of these programs, we would go down to this place called the Ozarks. This was in Missouri. And we would float down this river called the Current River in these big canoes. And so we'd all have our little teams and canoe down the river. And some people that could hardly get out of the car when they arrived were like climbing the cliffs and jumping in the water and just being playful. And it was, you know, it was transformational experience for me to see that, you know what, at the core of every human being actually is just this inner beautiful child that just wants love and connection. I think it was probably the most powerful thing that I got out of the entire experience is that every human being, because when these people showed up, it would all the judgment and just the, you know, judgment for me, I'm 13 and this person's morbidly obese and hooked up to machines and, and kind of angry and frustrated to the end, like being that same person's nearly like best friend and sitting and listening to the wisdom and their experiences behind all that. Uh, it really let me, if informed me on a level of like, you know what, every human being is actually good at the core. There's just a lot of trauma and things that have happened. And so I think it changed the way I saw people, my teachers, people I didn't like, my enemies and whatever, I started to have this kind of seed planted of, you know what, that's, it's not actually who they truly are. And if I make the choice to crack through those barriers, like with any individual, I actually have the power to develop a beautiful relationship with anyone in life. And any judgments and enemies that I have is actually my fault, because I have the power to seek to understand, you know, have courtesy and manners, respect and communicate to some degree. And of course, that's been a lifelong journey, but the seed was planted early on enough that it, yeah, gave me that power to really like connect with people, I think on a, a different level. Hmm. I think that's amazing that you think that at every human being's core is a good person. So what do you think then informs people's decisions when they don't operate in a good way? Trauma. Plain and simple. Yeah. You know, we have a mother and we have a father and that's our first experience of life. And so if my father traumatizes me, then I form an opinion about men in general. Or if my mother doesn't give me the love or experience or traumatizes me, then it informs me about mothering and what I have to do to be worthy of a woman or worthy of love and nurturing and these sorts of things. So I think it really starts there with trauma. Um, and, you know, for some people like myself, it was just missing I didn't have a, a father. So it was just like this missing thing. Um, but yeah, coming back to your question, I think that whatever traumatic experiences people have in childhood, especially the first seven years are considered the most formative. And these are deep subconscious things that we're unaware of. And it's really the subconscious that's just kind of like running our lives. So if I was traumatized by a teacher, by a man or brother, or whoever it was throughout my life, I'm probably going to judge and attract these kind of experiences of having these constant issues with business partners and men and, you know, always trying to take my stuff or this kind of combatant type of experience until I really go deep and back and heal these traumas and these wounds. And this is the thing about the, the ancient cultures is they taught that the most powerful experience for healing trauma is self-reflection. And the highest level of self-reflection is to go into seclusion and fast. And so I no longer have the capacity to just numb myself with food and distract myself. So when you stop all that, you're not suppressing and you know getting yourself stoned and distracting with all these things and maybe you're in nature or you're maybe you're in a place where you're forced into this situation of just self-reflection my experience of fasting for extended periods is at some point your mind kind of goes into this like reviewing process where it's like you're taken back 
and you're actually seeing you having memories of your mother and your father in school and relationships and and you're able to see it from a higher perspective and see you know oh now i'm not the child being traumatized i can actually see my father's perspective i can see my teacher's perspective and these are the types of things that happened to me so in my 20s i did like an extended water fast for example i went to pensacola florida for 14 days to just water fast in a tent and it was probably around like day 11 or 12 where I woke up in my tent, I'm just kind of sitting there, but it was like I was having this very clear, it was like a vision. It's the only way I can describe it. Almost like I was seeing a screen out in front of me and watching a movie, but I was in the movie and I was in the sixth grade. And so it was just me like sitting at my desk and Mrs. Riggs and I remembered her name and I remembered all the kids in class and it was almost like I could interact, but I was seeing myself and my relationships with all these kids. And it was like, why, you know, rewinding and fast forwarding and seeing kind of the things that were happening in the sixth grade and why I felt so judged by Mr. Saxton, this other teacher and Mrs. Riggs. And I was constantly like out in the hall or going to detention or having these things. I was a rebel. Um, and I could see their perspective. It's like, oh, well, they were just trying to <laughs> have a class and teach something. And I was, you know, this kind of rebellious kid. And what was interesting is the next day, then I was in the fifth grade and the next day, then I was in the fourth grade. And it was like, I was being, and I wasn't trying to do this. It was just like each day I was going back a year and seeing and feeling it was like, it was not just like seeing it like a movie. It was like, I was viscerally feeling the relationships and it would take me to these points where, you know, I was getting beat up by a bully or, you know, just these interactions with girls and what they would say. And I felt, you know, felt like nobody or minimized because of something they said negative or whatever it was. And it wasn't just the negative. It was a lot of the positive and heartfelt stuff too. But even back to the point of like second grade and sitting, you know, I'm sitting in this like assembly hall with all the teachers and we got up and we sang our school song and I fully sang it in that moment, had no idea that I had a school song in elementary school. And all of a sudden I'm like, Hey, we're from Linwood. Give us a cheer. Hear all the voices singing far and near. For we are the best, folks. We are the best. And man, just like overwhelming, just emotion and memory and stuff. And I think beyond my comprehension, a level of like traumatic releasing and judgment and healing that was taking place, where it was like, it was allowing me to no longer have to be that rebel and judge the police and judge teachers and, you know, as them being wrong and I'm right. It just, it was a big transformational experience. And of course there was, you know, some moments that were really traumatic that I was able to see the other side. Um, so I think in order for us to truly heal and move on as humans, we have to review and heal you know you got a past relationship with a man or a woman it was their the love of your life they broke your heart they cheated on you or they did something and it was just huge traumatic experience well if you don't really review and heal and see their perspective and and get back to a situation of true forgiveness and love you'll always carry this deep wound and what happens is you get into a new relationship. And as soon as your partner maybe says or does something like that old situation, you're immediately right back at this level of like hate or judgment or pointing fingers or this frustration that doesn't make sense. It's actually just this core wound. And so to be able to move on and truly connect and love once again, like it's nearly impossible unless we go through these experiences. And I know that, you know, over the years of running clinical fasting programs, I would invite people who did cranial sacral work and this clearing technique and, you know, breath work and all these different things. So I could see how different modalities had the power to clear this emotional trauma. But what I notice is when you'd put people into a situation of fasting for an extended period of time and then doing those things, I would say it was like 10 times the efficacy because people are just so open when they're fasting. So everything's ready to come to the surface and ready to clear. And once it clears, it's not just like, okay, well, this emotional stuff came up and I kind of got rid of it, but now I'm just going to go 
you know, eat food and kind of rebury these emotional molecules. Like I think on some level, emotional molecules are just as real as anything else. And so when somebody dies and you have grief and you end up eating a lot of certain foods, those grief molecules end up getting stored in our fat. And so when we're looking at somebody with a lot of fat, that's a lot of the emotional molecules that were just suppressed during that time with foods and that emotions still there. You can see it. It's, we call it emotional baggage. It's actually physical baggage. And when people fast, they reduce fat at such a fast rate that these emotional molecules come out. And of course, whether you're guided or not, if you put somebody on an extended water fast, you're going to have these days where these emotional molecules are released and people are experiencing it. So I believe they can heal just through the process of fasting. But if you have somebody there that can be like, oh, this is what's coming up. Because people don't know. They're just like, am I dying? Uh, I'm all emotional. I, and that's typically when somebody would stop fasting. Like, I can't do this. You know, old, like, father died or this thing happened or traumatic experiences. Those are typically the reasons people stop fasting, not because they're actually hungry. Because you're not actually hungry. So, you know, I've just found that over time and distance, having, you know, a group of individuals with different modalities to support the individual, because some individuals will really take to like breath work and clearing emotion that way. Some people will take to like meditation, vipassana and clearing emotion that way. Another person needs actual psychological guidance, like have asking questions, finding out you know, what specifically they're feeling and experiencing and where that comes from, taking them back to that time and then going through that experience so they can really clear all the emotional stuff and get to a place of <laughs> forgiveness and love and seeing that it happened for a reason so they could learn. Anyway, so that's a lot. So I think that a huge answer to probably a short question. <laughs> no, I think it's brilliant. Because I love what you are going into, especially in terms of healing through this process. Because I think in today's society, when we're thinking about health and especially physical health, what we're really looking at is the aesthetic of it, right? We want to look good. Like, does the world visibly perceive me as good looking? And that's usually the motivation for trying to get into shape getting healthy, eating right, you know, and when you're speaking about health from a, you know, physiological and spiritual setting, it really makes a lot of sense. So for people, you know, the physiology between mind and body, because I love that you made the analogy about eating, because it's literally the expression is stuffing down your emotions, right? You're stuffing it down. Um, and so what is that relationship between mind and body? that causes us to get into these states whereby we need to come to a, you know, fasting retreat. Yeah. I love the, the questioning here. Um, and it, there's multiple directions at which I could take this. There's a spiritual conversation um, that a lot of people maybe want to have, et cetera. And then there's some people maybe aren't willing to go there with that type of conversation. Um, but the, the body mind spirit connection is powerful. And I also love that you're willing to go there with the truth. The truth is we all just want to look good and beautiful and not be judged and accepted. And a lot of times when we do the very actions that create a situation of ugliness, um, we see the ugliness within ourselves and we have, we're all conscious beings observing what's happening out there. And when we can see people look at us and judge us in a certain way, that's like knives, wounds, you know? And if you're feeling like, oh, these, everybody thinks I'm ugly. People don't like me. People judge me. They think I'm fat. What's that going to do? You know, on, on a wound level, it's more trauma. And so it drives us into a situation of, I don't want to go in public. I just want to sit back. And what makes me feel better? Well, when I eat ice cream, it tastes sweet and good. And so I feel better when I have chocolate. And so it's like, there's this separation and potential to just go dark, dark, dark. Mm -hmm. And I think if there's one piece that most people are not aware of that I'd like to get across is that it's not just physically what's going on that presents how we look into the world. It's also mentally and emotionally. 
So when I show up in life and I want to be of service and I love people and I love myself, you know, this has been a big thing for so many programs, people that come to my clinical fasting programs. At some point, we get to this point where I ask individually, do you love yourself? And for me, being someone who does love myself, it's shocking to hear that somebody could say no to that. And in fact, most of the people that come to my programs, when I'm sitting with them one-on-one, I'm like, ask them the question, do you love yourself? And then I really hold space. They can't say yes. They're just like, no, I don't. And then it's just like, wow, that's it. So that's what needs to shift and change and how do we go about a process of getting you to see your true self and love yourself? Because everybody, I don't care what you look like. Everybody is beautiful. Everybody is unique in some way. And for someone like myself or somebody who has learned to see the positive only, you'll see the the hairstyle the uniqueness, you'll see the clothing uniqueness, you'll see the uniqueness in their eyes or lips or nose or ears or whatever it is, and you can find these traits. Or if you simply just have a conversation in a certain way with people, you'll see their beautiful soul shine through in some way with whatever they're passionate about. And that's the thing that needs to be amplified And others need to see about that individual that's unique and say, wow, you are beautiful because you have this piece of the puzzle and these things that are so unique that can, you know, shine and glow. And so, yeah, I think that a big part of looking good physically is the belief that we have in ourselves and how we show up in the world. And I genuinely believe like if I'm a courageous person, I'm helping people and I'm doing good things, what I say, what I speak, what I think and what I do actually changes my face in certain ways. Um, And this is called physiognomy. So it's, it's it's the knowledge that you can actually look at a person's lips, nose, eyes, face, body structure. And kind of know a lot about if they're happy, if they're outgoing, if they're, you know, all these different types of things. You can see it. It shows up. You know, this the simple way of kind of describing this is if someone's always kind of sad and, and not feeling good, the, the corners of the mouth will actually turn down. And somebody who's genuinely kind of just happy and balanced and present, it just stays straight. And someone who's like happy all the time, you'll see these certain lines and things that show up that are kind of a a lasting effect of happiness and joy. So I think that if you can get this message across to individuals that, hey, we have the capacity to go into a situation of fasting, for example, and as you're fasting and clearing these traumas, mentally and emotionally, you're in a situation of forgiveness and a higher level of joy and love and things come through that will physically start to change your facial appearance. Not only that, but in the situation of fasting, being in ketosis, the body's going to reduce fat. And when you reduce fat and ketosis specifically from fasting, what are released also are called embryonic style stem cells. So these embryonic style stem cells, if you've ever researched stem cell technology like it's it's amazing what it has the capacity to do for healing and so these stem cells have something called pluripotency so after about three days of fasting on water or no calories you have these stem cells traveling through everywhere through every you know artery capillary vein through your body through your lymphatic system and they have the capacity to take the place of either weak or worn out or cells that need to be eliminated. And so what's happening in this process of mentally and emotionally kind of upgrading and being able to see that show on somebody's face on a very physical level, the fat, believe it or not, is the potential for more stem cells. So the truth is the more fat you have, the more potential for stem cells you have to be released in your body and to actually regenerate everything. 
So like University of Southern California, this guy, Professor Longo, wrote all these articles and kind of proved and put out all this science about these stem cells and said within three days, there's enough stem cells to completely rebuild your immune system. But beyond three days, that's where if you've had a stab wound, if you've injured your knee, if you have a skin condition, if you have a brain problem or trauma or something that's off from a brain injury, um, these stem cells can actually start to become new neurons. They can build any part of the body. Um, and a perfect example of this is we have this woman named Jennifer Ritchie. And anybody watching could go look up YouTube, Jennifer Ritchie, last name R-I-T-C-H-I-E, Ritchie. She, a beautiful young woman, fell off a two-story building and shattered her lower vertebrae and completely broke everything. So she had these titanium rods installed and the medical doctor said, look, we need to cut function in order to save function. So they did something called an iatrogenic surgery and they cut the spine. So when you cut the spine, it's called a complete paraplegic, meaning you can never have any function or movement beyond that injury site. So below her lower back, she would never have feeling or function ever again. And she's on all kinds of medications and doing this stuff. And she just happened to live in the same area as my father. My father heard about this woman. She was on the news when it happened and all this. And she's a complete paraplegic. She's pretty much skinny and on pills just to go poo and pretty much dying. And my father meets her and says, look, you know, there's this thing called fasting. And when you fast, the body goes in, it clears out scar tissue called autolysis. The body creates embryonic style stem cells. And these stem cells have the capacity to rebuild damaged tissue. And I, and my, my father's like, I believe you can heal yourself if you're willing to go through this process. And this woman if you watch the video, she says it, <laughs> why she did it, but most people wouldn't just do this, especially being as skinny as she did. She actually did an extended water fast. And after the extended water fast, she just was basically drinking smoothies and having aloe vera and eating this food stuff we have called pulse, which is like a certain mixture of nuts and seeds and roots, you know, ancient whole food. Um, and she started wiggling her toe. And so all the doctors and we have, we did a little mini doco of like the physical therapist and the doctors and showing the scans and all the things. So you can see that it's totally real. And they all freaked out. Oh my God, this is impossible. You know, if you sever the spinal cord and you can never move anything again, how is this possible if she's wiggling her toe? And of course, every step of the way, they're like, oh, but you'll never wiggle another toe. And then she's wiggling multiple. Oh, we've done great, but you'll never move the other toe. And then she's moving this one. And over time and distance, she's moving her feet. She's moving her legs. Long story short, she went through all the physical therapy, like literally on these things inside of a pool, just moving her body through leg braces, the whole thing until a couple years later, literally ran a marathon unassisted. Yeah, legit. And these are the types of experiences that I've seen since 13 years of age, people healing from these radical, uncurable, you know, processes um, so if you can regrow a spinal cord fully, what else is possible with stem cells? And then, you know, when I was about 28 years old, I set up a clinical fasting situation in Bali, Indonesia, and started to facilitate and run these fasting situations like my father did when I was a young teenager. And from there, I really opened up wanting to look at the different modalities and mental, emotional side of things, not just physical and really developed all the foundational stuff my father taught me. I wanted the science and to go deep on each individual area to really help people with not only detoxification and healing, but lifestyle in general. So you never get to these points, you know, of major disease. I mean, everything you've discussed, it sounds incredible, but it also sounds like oh my gosh, right? We've seen this kind of stuff on TV. We've seen testimonials of this, but for mm -hmm. some reason, we really struggle to commit to the process. And so when it comes to, you know, doing fasting, getting into this, if someone isn't coming to work with you, Tyler, is this a process people should be following on their own or should they be in a clinic or working with someone? 
that's the best question you could ask in this situation because people are like, oh my God, I can heal. Let's just go fast on water. <laughs> Please don't do that. Uh, you could die uh, if you don't do it correctly. Um, you know, and that's obviously worst case scenario. Most people could learn, read a book, do some things and maybe kind of do it. But most people won't be successful because of the emotional stuff that comes up and because of the physical toxicity that comes up. So one of the biggest things people need to learn is these four channels of elimination I talked about earlier, defecation, urination, perspiration, and respiration. You know, how, how are you clearing out your bowels while you're fasting to make sure those acids and things aren't building up? How much are you drinking to make sure the urinary system is able to eliminate all that acid? How much are you sweating and opening up your skin to allow toxins to come out? And what kind of breathing exercises are you constantly doing to eliminate acid oxygenate, alkalize the body. And if you're observing these four and a fifth one comes in when you're fasting, but if you observe these four, then you're going to have the, the best possible situation of fasting to not be toxic and feel like you're going to die. The other part of that is the actual mental and emotional support. So if, you know, if you want to just go fast by yourself, everyone around you is going to, you're stupid, you're going to die you know, you're going to become deficient, you're going to ruin your metabolism. There's all these things that people just don't know about fasting. You know, thousands of years ago, Pythagoras, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, you know, Moses, Jesus, like everybody, fasting was just a, a norm. Obviously, for some of the greater masters, they took it the distance, you know, 40 days fast, 30 days fast, things like this. But today, it's just completely unknown. So everybody's against you in the process. And just one person saying, oh, you're, you're looking sick. You're, you know, you look like you're going to die. You need to stop there. You're going to be like, oh, shit, maybe I am. I need to stop. But when you're with an entire group of people, either online forum or physically, and we're all doing it together. And in fact, you know, I'm on day three of a fast and that guy's on day five and this person's on day 10. And, you know, when we're all together, you can see other people physically going through this stuff. It's like, well. I feel like I'm going to die, but so does all these other people. So I guess it's going to be okay. And we're having the conversations about what's coming up and what do you feel and what are the emotions and you're able to really go deep. That's where the true magic and healing happens. And this is hard to get across. It's like, you know, I ran these 30 day programs in Bali for however many years, probably seven or eight years realistically, but running these things three or four times a year for 30 days. Uh, we had 30 days prep where they need to eat a certain way and clean a certain way and get ready and build up all their nutrients. We'd look at their blood tests to make sure they're not deficient, et cetera, et cetera. And then they would come and do 30 days of a fasting program. Typically 21 of those days was actually water fasting, you know, 20 to 28 water fasting or juice fasting. Then we'd break the fast with them, get them nourished and feeling like they have energy and feeling good and go into the toilet again before we'd send them back home. And then we'd spend 30 days with them, making sure they're integrating, breaking the fast properly and, and living that better lifestyle so that the disease wouldn't return. And typically when I'm doing you know, educational programs and stuff, I'm actually showing the slideshows of people with prostate cancer, liver cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, skin cancer, brain tumors, because those are the most of the people I attracted was people with cancer, but then there was people with heart disease, diabetes, autoimmune conditions of all kinds. Um, and I show their blood tests before and after, and I talk about the emotional clearing experiences and everything that they went through in this process of healing. So essentially what I've done, you know, in the last, since I was like 28 and 42 now, um, I've pretty much replicated what my dad was doing when I was a teenager, but just on a level of like clinical monitoring with clinical fasting doctors and naturopaths and other, and tracking and keeping files on every single person so that we can prove over time and distance if, if we can get 10 people with liver cancer to heal through the same process, that's a pretty significant level of clinical evidence leaning towards the fact that it can, it can, it can be done. Right. And so that's my goal is these days I'm training coaches around the world and teaching them in the same processes. And some of them are naturopaths. 
Some of them are nurses. Some of them are coming from all walks of life that are looking for kind of something new to do for a living. Uh, and we're all every week getting together and sharing the results of this person with breast cancer, this person with colon cancer, this person with autoimmune condition, candida, little stuff, big stuff, and consistently testing what works with herbology, what works with foods, what works with mental and emotional clearing techniques and fasting modalities, juice fasting, herbal fasting, water fasting. And, you know, I, I'm the type of individual that's always interested in learning. Um, I don't think my way is the only way whatsoever. Um, and in fact, I know there's so much more to learn. So that's kind of the, the path that I'm on and, and just want to share essentially what I have learned with those individuals out there who might feel a spark of like, oh, wow, maybe I could take this on and try this. And again, back to your question, I have educational programs, like a three-day event where I teach everything so that if the individual is really that intellectual type that can, oh yeah, well, I need to do this, this, and this, and this to prepare for the fast. Then I need to do this, this, and this while I'm fasting. And then I need to do this, 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 and this to break the fast. And then afterwards, those then anybody can pretty much have access to that, come and do that and go off and do it themselves. And of course, when they come to that program, they're also meeting my coaches and meeting each other. So, you know, there's all kinds of little Facebook groups and different things that get created where people end up supporting each other through the process. And I think it's great. Um, or they can, you know, slightly more because I'm paying, you know, my gurus and teachers and taking my time where they can actually come and go through this entire three month process fully facilitated online something we call know thyself oh i love that and as we i can't believe where we are in the interview we almost have to wrap up but are there ever any people that you like that do not qualify or that you just think you are not currently ready for this process yeah i mean i have a tough time turning anyone away so there have been quite a few cases of people in the past where my clinical fasting doctors are like look they can come to the program, they could do this, but this is the type of situation they're going to die. And so if you're willing to take that on, knowing that they could die while they're in your care or even doing the process, they're probably going to have, you know, breakthroughs and experiences, but this is pretty aggressive and they're most likely going to die afterwards. There are those types. Um, and like I said, I inform the people like this is what my clinical fasting doctor said, which sucks because even being told that it's not going to be successful is kind of that nocebo effect. But I tell people, look, I don't believe that. I've seen miracles my entire life. I believe if there's something inside of you that has a reason and purpose to live and you really show up, I believe you can heal. I'll give you a thousand percent. If you give us a hundred percent, you know, and I'll work with you and try to do that thing. Um, I've had situations of people where I, I believe that it didn't work because they were unwilling to show up in certain ways. Um, there's a really good example of a man that came along um, and, you know, he was willing to do everything physically, but as soon as we did breath work or there was something that potentially was going to activate, because I think he did have a little bit of this emotional thing and his wife was with him and he was just like, I'll do everything you say physically, but I will not do the emotional stuff. I'm not going to do the breath work. I'm not going to do this and this, and just don't even ask. You know, I think in certain situations where people have blocked, it should be like, well, okay, that's great. You know, here's the information, maybe go and do it. But, you know, I, the truth is I want to work with people who are hundred percent committed and willing to go through every aspect because I believe the reason he passed away was because he wasn't willing to actually go back and open up Pandora's box and go through the major trauma that was stored inside of him potentially that's what you know partially what tumors are they're these storage containers of the toxic physical but emotional experiences and things that people have to be willing to to let go of so i hope that answers your question absolutely um, sorry one more thing uh what might disqualify people for the actual fasting would be certain nutritional deficiencies etc so i do have those cases where people sign up and they want to come along and then we're looking at their bloods 
and we have 30 days to get them into a good enough place to be able to do the process like water fasting or whatever it is. But if we can't get them to that place, they may need to do like juice fasting or raw foods or something quite different. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. This was such an informative interview, but I've got two final rapid fire questions that have nothing to do with health or fasting. Um, <laughs> so the first one is what is real success to you? Happiness. So for me, it's genuine happiness. And I would attribute a level of like self-love and peace like real actually just being happy with what we have currently and being at peace as a level of happiness is success. And of course, I believe there's a lot of factors involved that need to be put in place to have a, a true level of happiness and peace. So it's, it sounds easy maybe, um, but it's a, it's a pretty, dynamic learning and growth process and success in different areas that will lead to ultimate peace and balance and happiness. Absolutely. And it actually doesn't sound easy because so many people are always seeking happiness. Uh, and the final question for you, Tyler, is what is something about you that we will not find on Google? <laughs> Probably that I'm missing a finger. Oh, do you want to tell us a story? What happened? Yeah, I was uh, actually two and a half years old when it happened. Yeah. Ha, 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 I know. ha. Maybe two and a third. Um, we actually went to Hawaii. And on the way back from Hawaii, we traveled through SeaTac Airport in Seattle. And my mom was kind of watching my brother while he was using the toilet. And I went and I started crawling up the escalator. And back then, the escalators weren't designed like they are today. Probably changed because of me. I'm the poster boy. Uh, and it came down and smashed my finger and got stuck. And so my mom got on it, rode to the top and tried to lift me up. And it was stuck and blood everywhere. And, and so since then, I, I love it, though. Like it gave me definitely a personality of doing things with it when I was a kid in school, like it became my unique little thing. Uh, and even to this day, there's times where I'm like, oh, whoa, I'm missing a finger. I'm one of the you know, weird people that are missing something. <laughs> oh. No judgment. <laughs> That is fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for sharing of yourself in this interview, Tyler. It has been such a privilege having you on the show. Thank you, Candice. It's been a privilege meeting you. You're beautiful and looking forward to getting to know you maybe more later. Thank you. Every part of that interview had me thinking. So I want to know what stood out for you. I love reading your comments, so make sure you are leaving them below. As always, it has been my honor to serve you and I look forward to doing it again next week.